We proudly welcome artist Samantha Sherry as our sponsor on the How to Love Lit podcast. Sam is a world-class artist specializing in animal portraits. We invite you to check out her work at samanthasherry.com. Tell her Christian Gary sent you. Again, samanthasherry.com. I'm Christy Shriver. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy our discussions about the Western world's most amazing pieces of literature. Uh, Today, we began by discussing one of the most inspiring humans of the 20th century. Among his many other accomplishments, which we'll talk about today, he produced 57 works, including what is arguably the most moving expressions of Holocaust literature ever recorded, the memoir Night and the Man, Elie Wiesel. Well, and as I think about how to begin to describe this man and his legacy, there is really only one word that comes to my mind, and that word is the word reverence. Elie Wiesel was an author, he was a teacher, he chaired many political action committees, but more than that, he developed and became a moral authority. In 1986, when he won the Nobel Peace Prize, the chairman of that committee, Egil Arvik, in his presentation speech said this, Elie Wiesel has emerged as one of the most spiritual leaders and guides in an age when violence, repression, and racism continue to characterize the world. Wiesel is a messenger to mankind. His message is one of peace, atonement, and human dignity. His belief that the forces fighting evil in the world can be victorious is a hard-won belief. And the question is, I mean, how how can that be true? His story is terrible. The upheaval of his life is representative of one of the worst atrocities ever recorded in human history. Uh, just his little town of Siget, Hungary, tells a story. Uh, when he lived there as a child, it was a vibrant community. Uh, both Christians and Jews, and it was a large center of Jewish learning. And out of the town's uh, total population of 25,000, 10,000 people belonged to the Jewish community. And following the Holocaust, only about 50 Jewish families remained there, and that remains true to this day. Uh, The people who were slaughtered, many who were slaughtered before Wiesel's eyes, were his community, people like his mother sister who he describes walking away to the ovens before he even understood what those were. His father and his friends and his cousins all walked away into the ovens made for humans or died of even worse things like starvation and exposure to cold. Elie Wiesel's world disintegrated beyond just what could be described as death, but he isn't unique in this. As we know, it's estimated that 6 million Jews and another 5 million non-Jews were systematically erased. And of those that were taken to camps to be slaughtered, only 250,000 lived to tell their stories. But even that number is one of many. Elie Wiesel emerged as a man who did not speak of revenge or reparations or retaliation, as you would expect. He did not live a life full of bitterness and excuses for failure or depression or defeat. His story is a message of redemption and forgiveness that leads to peace. But, you know, how did he get there? How does a person like that become a spiritual leader? It is a question that has never been more relevant to ask, and it's exactly how the Nobel Committee understood the meeting of his life. I believe his life and his message are even more important the farther we walk away from the atrocities of the 20th century and forget the scars that they've left, only one of which is the Nazi Holocaust. It's not the only one. There's atrocities that were committed by Stalin, Ceausescu, Pol Pot. There are genocides in the Congo, China, North Korea, Japan, and Turkey among others that dwarf any violence that the world had ever known up to that point, and all in an age of technology and culture and science. 
Eli Wiesel found an answer, and he has a soft voice, but in his concise style, he speaks truth, and it's an unarguable truth. As a man who has stared at evil in a way that almost no human has, and he walked away as a man of love, healing, and redemption. His story is powerful. His life is powerful, and his words are powerful. And I really do feel a sense of humility in discussing his work and the grave responsibility to communicate it properly. So this is how I think it, we'd like to approach this story. This week, we're going to go through his life, his whole biography, and tell the story of, of Elie Wiesel, not just the months that he was in Auschwitz. We'll conclude by reading his remarks to President Ronald Reagan in 1985 in regard to President Reagan's visit to the German cemetery in Bitburg. Next week, and for the two weeks after that, we will study the text of Night through the lens of history and literature analysis. We'll explain the historical context of the story itself, the art involved, and highlight the important themes that Vizel deliberately laces through the text. The final week... We'll finish up our discussion and read the now famous address Elie Wiesel gave upon receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. So, knowing the plan, let's take at the look at the man from Sayet, Gary. It's hard <laughs> for me to it's hard for me to pronounce. I want to say Siget, but yeah. I I mean that's the English pronunciation. But I know they they say it a little bit differently in, in Hungarian. Well, let me tell you, we have several tricky words to to get through. Uh, so, well, Sayet is this little town situated um, in the Carpathian Mountains, and the Carpathian Mountains, by the way, are the third longest European mountain range. There's your trivia for the day, uh, and they're in Eastern Europe. Last week we talked about the Czech Republic. That's the same area that we're talking about today. And today, these mountains border Slovakia and Poland and Hungary and Serbia, but uh, mostly Romania. Sayet, Eli's town, is on the border between Romania and Ukraine. But that's if you look at a modern map today. And, and as we all know, that part of the world has been divided up many times. And when Vizel was born, it was actually part of Hungary. Uh, today, if you visit it, you'll find that around... 80% of the people there are, in fact, Romanian, but that was not the case in 1940. At the start of World War II, almost one-third of Sayet were Jewish, and uh, all kinds of Jews, which is something Vizel references in the very first line of night when he says, and I quote, they called him Moshe the Beetle, as though he had never had a surname in his life. He was a man of all work at a Hasidic synagogue. And I know we'll talk more about what that means next week, but in 1941, Sayet was a very diverse community, but it was also caught in uh, horrible political maneuverings between the Nazis and the Italian fascists who were divvying up Europe between themselves. And uh, even for those who never left Sayet, many would have been born in a country called Hungary and died in one that was called Romania. Uh, this is, again, exactly what happened, or like what happened in Franz Kafka's hometown of Prague in the Czech Republic. Which, of course, would have been completely unbeknownst to little Elie Wiesel, born in 1928. And just for context, if you finished our Kafka series, this is 40 years after Kafka's born and 13 years after The Metamorphosis is published. So if you've listened to those, there's your context. One thing that I find amazing is that Vizel never lost his love for this region, even though he never went back there really to live. I read where he said that he never got over the beauty of mountains to the point that he preferred mountains over trips to the beach or any other of the world's beautiful settings. And he also admitted that when he wrote the manuscripts for his books, which he did by hand, by the way, which I find that crazy, but he always wrote them with a picture of Saget placed beside where he was writing. He was asked about this, and he said it reminded him during his creative process of the many joyful experiences of life from growing up those years with his family and all the love that that represented to him. So as we'll see again next week, Kelly's was ill father, was a local grocer and a very respected member of, of their community, and his mother was a homemaker. She was very well educated. 
Her father was an extremely respected Hasidic farmer. Uh, they had uh, four children. And so Ellie had three sisters, Hilda, Batya, or really Beatrice was her full name, and then the youngest, Zipporah. They were very literary because of their mother just insisted. She was a big reader, and she really promoted this among all of her children. And they were a musical family, and Ellie learned to play the violin. But as we will see in night, most importantly, this family was a very observant religious family and very much uh, observed their Jewish faith. Well, of course, all of this came crashing down, as we'll see, uh, detailed in night in the summer of 1944 when the Nazis arrived in Syed, rounded up the entire Jewish population and loaded them into trains, uh, taking them to Auschwitz. For the next 11 months, um, 16-year-old Ellie would experience what cannot be described I mean, the most humiliating, gruesome torture conceivable by man, and what the adult Elie Wiesel chooses to represent with words 10 years later in the memoir Night. Two of Ellie's sisters, Hilda and Bacha, uh, also managed to survive the massacre, unbeknownst to Ellie, but his parents, his grandparents, other relatives, and his baby sister, Sapor, all died in the camps. And at the end of the war, after being moved around and surviving one of Hitler's infamous death marches, Ellie watches his father die of dysentery. And all of this is in the memoir, but the memoir ends with him alone in Buchenwald, Germany. And he's there for the now famous Jewish uprising against the SS in the camp. And he survived and watched the arrival of the United States Third Army that liberated the camp on April 11th, 1945. But again, you know, when you read the story, you know, I always had wondered, I've read this book every year for the last decade and you wonder well what happened next because well even after liberation ellie almost doesn't survive and actually lots of holocaust survivors died right after liberation three days after being liberated and he describes this at the end of night he gets food poisoning because his body has completely lost the ability to digest food so vizel ends night with this very famous moment he looks in the mirror to see himself and it's an unrecognizable person. He doesn't recognize his own physical appearance. However, what is not recorded in night is his reaction to that person that he sees in the mirror. And what he does is he shatters that mirror with his fist. And as soon as he's able, he gets pencil and paper and begins to write down all the memories. He wants to write them all down what had happened at Birkenau in Auschwitz, although he had no intent of ever sharing these experiences with anyone. He made a vow to not do it. It would be years before he could express these to the world. And as we now understand, uh, he needed that time. It took 10 years to think about, to forgive, to process, to articulate. But in 1945, after Buchenwald and after recovering from food poisoning, what was a little Jewish homeless teenager to do? Where could he go? I can't even imagine the feeling, the lostness. There's no home to go back to. There's no family members. There's no world. There's nothing. He was well-educated for a teenager. He spoke four languages, Yiddish, Hebrew, Hungarian, and German, but what good could any of those languages do for him now? That's true. And you have to remember the world is still not a welcoming place for the Jews in 1945, not even after the Holocaust. Uh, Ellie wanted to go to Palestine, but there were severe immigration limitations. So that was out. Uh, he originally had planned to go to Belgium because they were accepting Jewish immigrants. But General Charles de Gaulle, to his credit, wished to receive the homeless immigrants, and so uh, Vizel's train was rerouted. He's taken to an orphanage in Normandy, but he can't understand a word uh, around him. Uh, the obvious first order of business was to learn French. I mean, that would become his new mother tongue in a sense. And uh, this is where we really discover how brilliant of a man Elie Wiesel really is. I mean, not only is he able to master the language, 
but he competes and ultimately gains admission into the Sorbonne in Paris. And as you know, that's one of the world's premier universities. And he, uh, he studied philosophy and literature and language. He worked as a translator, uh, even tried to join the Israeli army and go to Israel. He was rejected, though, for medical reasons. And ultimately, he landed a job as a journalist and finally made it to Israel to work in the Tel Aviv office. And once in Tel Aviv, he gets a second journalism job. Even back then, journalism did not pay well, and he was very poor. So he worked at both places. But this second newspaper, an Israeli newspaper, offered him a gig that sent him to India. Uh, it was in India that he learned English. So now we're going to add that as another language. <laughs> He's and up to six. In his capacity uh, as a journalist, he gets an opportunity that will change his life forever. And 1954, Vizel interviewed French um, Nobel Prize winning novelist Francois Mariac. I don't know if I said that correctly, but close enough. Mariak took a strong uh, interest in this uh, this bright young uh, Holocaust survivor, and he became Vizel's friend and his adult mentor. And Mariak persuaded Vizel to break his self imposed ten year vow of silence um, about his time in the camps and to write his memoir, which Vizel did do. Uh, the name of that book was "And the World Remained Silent." It took Vizel two years to complete the manuscript, and uh, interestingly enough, it wasn't written in English or French, but in Yiddish, uh, because that's Vizel's heart language. And this original memoir is 800 pages long. <laughs> well, uh, sadly, but probably not surprisingly, no one wanted to print the book, not even with the support of a Nobel Prize winner promoting it. And finally, they found one publisher willing to do it in Buenos Aires, but the success of the book was limited for obvious reasons. It was in Yiddish and it was long. Uh, that next year, Bazell's job invited him to move to New York City and uh, be a foreign correspondent covering the United Nations. And New York City is ultimately where he settles for the rest of his life. And uh, Christy, what can you tell us about the New York years? Well, it started a little rough with his third if you brush with death if you want to count the entire concentration camp as one experience but in 1956 he gets struck by a taxi of all things trying to cross the street and this is going to result in a 10-hour surgery he's hospitalized for months and he's in a wheelchair for over a year but his problems aren't just medical and i guess you don't think about this but He's actually a stateless person at the time. Because he's disabled, he can't travel to France to renew his identity card, which is all he has. So he wasn't a French citizen, although he could have become one. When he first came over, they said, who wants to be French citizens? But he didn't speak French, so he didn't know to say anything, and so he didn't. So now he's he hasn't had a, a, a citizenship all this time. But he doesn't even now have an identity card because it expired and he can't renew it. But he can't renew his visa to stay in the United States because he doesn't have a proper ID card. So he kind of reminds me of that Tom Hanks character in the movie, The Terminal. Oh, <laughs> At least he's a... not in the airport. Oh, my gosh. Well, he had other issues. So, I mean, <laughs> uh, what, but unlike Victor Navorsky, the character in that movie, Vizel found out that being stateless actually made him eligible to become a legal resident, which is what he did. And although Vizel will actually not be a citizen of any place on Earth until 1963, when he's granted American citizenship and he gets an American passport, the first passport he had ever had, he does, though, years later become a French citizen through his relationship to his close friend, Francois Mitterrand, who became president of France. Well, getting back to his writings, Vassell's mother, whose own father, I, I think I mentioned this, was a very devout Hasidic Jew, had always wanted her son to be a rabbi and a Ph.D., and of course, Ellie knew this. His dad, who, had watched, who he had watched die slowly in Buchenwald, was a man who actually had been jailed. I should have mentioned this when we were talking about their early history, but he was in jail during World War II at one point for helping Jews escape the Nazis from other parts of Hungary in those early years, ironically. But Wiesel, so what you can see through his parents is he has the strong foundation of faith that he gets from his mother, who was very religious, and the strong sense of justice that he inherited from his father. And what we will see 
that this becomes this driving force, really, for a lot of his writings uh, for the rest of his life. And I don't know if that's the right word, but it's a calling that he clearly feels to communicate faith and truth through words. Uh, There's one nice anecdote. Well, I don't know that anything about the Holocaust could be called nice, but this is a nice story. When Ellie was in his 30s, he actually has an opportunity to go back to Sayet. And while he's there, he's walking around the city that he doesn't recognize. There's, there aren't the people that he knew or any of the places. Uh, they weren't really familiar in the same way. But he gets to the remains of the only synagogue left in the town And miraculously, he finds in a pile of discarded books a commentary, a rabbinic commentary, well, it's not really rabbinic, but a Jewish commentary that he had written himself when he was 12 and it survived all those years. So for Ellie, um, he's made this decision after his first book to write books, and he will do this for the rest of his life. He'll write one a year, pretty much without exception. And they're all going to be in French, not Yiddish or Hebrew, even though Yiddish was a very personal language for him. Hebrew was the language, obviously, of the Bible, and he certainly was never going to write in Hungarian or German because these represent nothing but pain and oppression, and not even English. He found his voice in the French language. Well, uh, of course, that makes sense. I mean, he was educated in France in those years after the Holocaust, and he studied there, and it seems French thought had a tremendous influence on the development of his thinking. Well, there's a good point to be made, but I've read a lot of things that he found it difficult to speak in French about Jewish thought because the words are so different and the ideas and the narratives are coming from different places. So when they say when you read his writings... It's a different style than you would normally get. I don't know, but... Well, that's a topic that we've discussed before on the podcast, the, the idea of translating a story and how the original language will lose all, a lot of nuances when you put it in a, in a separate language. Right, and he found that going on in his own head. Yes, which is no, <laughs> a separate psychological yeah. uh, thing we could do. We'll say that for later. Uh, but as I studied his life, I was amazed to see how much existential thought impacted his thinking. I mean, guys like Kafka and Camus and Sartre and all the guys we just talked about. True. But unlike those guys, you know, he was, well, he became, he had lost his faith. We'll see that in the book, but he became a a man of great faith. Uh, And we'll see in Ellie a Jewish understanding. And he understands uh, life through storytelling and the storytelling of the human experience. And that is a perspective that is unique, taking the idea that this is a man who walked through uh, the Holocaust. So you join his storytelling Jewishness with the perspective from the Holocaust and you add it to this secular humanist ideals that he learned from the Sorbonne and these French intellectuals. And all of that is really going to be expressed uh, in one, well, in every single piece of writing that we're going to see him write over the course of his life, which begins, of course, with his memoir. It's going to start in 1958, and he releases the book La Nuit, La Nuit or Night, but it wasn't in English. Uh, Mariak wrote the foreword to the book, and he helped him condense those 800 word, <laughs> pa- words or pages, I'm sorry, into 127 pages. That's a lot of pages. condensing. Right. And, you know, I guess you have to take out, I mean, I, can, I haven't read the full 800 pages, but I know there must have been a lot of important detail that maybe it was important for him to express as a person. I can't speak to that. But uh, Mariak also pressured uh, France's most prestigious publishing house, La Edition de Minuit, to pr- <laughs> I know to publish it uh, because that was its own problem. But as soon as it was published, it was an immediate success. Two years later, a woman by the name of Stella Rodway masterfully translated it into English. And again, it was rejected by 20 publishers in the English language, but finally it did get published. And again, immediately, the English-speaking world, not just America, but all of the English-speaking world, embraced it. And Vizel became immediately 
uh, an established writer. And interestingly enough, he takes on an unusual genre. He doesn't try to just write nonfiction or things around the Holocaust from a historical sense or, or even a philosophical or religious sense, which you might think he would. Uh, he wrote primarily fiction, but fiction sort of because he would uh, blend autobiography with the fiction. And not too long after night, he composed, I'm going to say it in English, Dawn in 1960 and Le Jour, The Accident, one year later. And in Dawn, Vizel portrays a Holocaust survivor who travels to the newly born state of Israel to participate in that country's birth and struggle. Uh, you know, the events were real, but the characters are blends of real and fiction. And as for uh, Le Jour or The Accident, it's basically the story of his accident. So you can see the pattern in his writing. And like I mentioned, he'll write a book uh, every year for the rest of his life, but they are not all fiction. He usually tried to write fiction in. He would always have two works going, one fiction, one nonfiction all the time. His fourth novel uh, was based on his experiences when he went back to Sayet in 1962, and it's called Beyond the Wall. Again, it's the same idea. You're merging fiction with the expressions of the Holocaust. In that book, he creates a character who survives the Holocaust. And unlike him, who went to Belgium, this character returns to his hometown. Uh, and he sees the before and after, and he relives all the memories, which were things, of course, that he would have experienced himself. But everyone who lived in the town when he was there was gone. And his return, he came back as a complete stranger. He actually won a literary award for that book. Well, I know we're going to talk about uh, Vizel's humanitarian efforts as a recognized celebrity, but one thing I think is worth mentioning before we leave our discussion of his literary career, uh, and it's well stated by Dr. Ted Estes from the University of Houston, and he points it out in his book, Elie Vizel. He says this, and I quote, It is true that Vizel comes to reject despair and death in favor of hope and life, but it is also true that the Holocaust remains ever with him. It is an agony that abides. This is the foundation of Elie Wiesel's life and work. And I think Wiesel understood that about himself uh, really pretty early on. I was reading the description of the many thoughts that he describes going through his head in New York when he was literally almost dying after being hit by that cab after surviving the Holocaust. And he says that lying in that bed, he began to understand actually for the first time. And he says that he understood that a person must choose between death and life and a person must select life. And you know, it isn't clear he believed that when he lived through the Holocaust. And night, we'll see that his survival was somewhat random and maybe pointless. But eventually, he understood that that's not the case. That as unimaginable as the Holocaust was, it would be counterproductive for him to persist just reliving the past. That he had no choice but to face the future with a constructive attitude to make a positive change in his own life, but without forgetting the past. And so... The older man who emerges from that hospital bed is a man who wanted to dedicate his life to inspiring others to create a world that better understands that we're capable of great good, but we're also capable of great evil. And he says this, and I quote, we, and he's talking about the survivors, we could have told the world, we don't trust you anymore. If all your civilization and culture could lead to the dehumanization, this total failure of man, we want no part of it. But we chose to become neither antisocial nor asocial. We refused to deal in hate. We became scientists and artists, teachers and musicians, and some even became writers. <laughs> and so Elie Wiesel really became a citizen, not just of any one country, but really he became a citizen of the world. And in the 80s, his celebrity grew and he began to address the world through the lecture circuit. And he became an advocate for places well beyond Poland and Hungary or even Europe. And the first place we see this is in his defense of Soviet Jews under the communist regime. 
Vizel ought to be credited as the first major writer to call attention to the plight of the Soviet Jewry, uh, something a lot of people still don't think about. And in the preface to The Jews of Silence, he wrote the pages that follow are the report of a witness, nothing more and nothing else. And their purpose is to draw attention to a problem about which no one should remain unaware. And he fought for and he succeeded in um, securing the unconditional release of the Soviet Jews from their bondage. And actually, ever since Glasnost, um, Jewish immigration has steadily expanded into a mass exodus of Soviet Jews that live in hostile environments and going to places such as Israel and other parts of the world where they're welcomed and uh, permitted to openly practice their faith. And he defended the Jewish state of Israel. Uh, he used his platform to bring attention to oppression wherever he saw it and, uh, in Cambodia or Biafra or uh, Paraguay or Bangladesh or South Sudan, just to name a few of places that drew his attention. And he allowed himself to be interviewed by the world's most influential journalists, and he ultimately won the Nobel Prize in 1986. Of course, it's this massive influence that leads us to the piece of literature that we'll be reading today uh, before we start with night next week. It's an address that he gives in Washington, D.C. Really, it's a public scolding, if you can believe it, to the president, Ronald Reagan. It's a kind of an unusual turn of events, a very unique time in history uh, that we're actually, I can, and I know you can too, we can like still remember it's recent history. So Gary, set up for this, the context for this speech that we're going to read. Uh I will, and I remember very clearly this was a huge controversy at the time that occurred. And you have to remember, it's 1985. Um, World War II's been over for 40 years. Germany's been split up in the East and West, and uh, the Russians control East Germany. And there is an independent state named West Germany, and it's a free democratic country. And Ronald Reagan has planned a state visit to acknowledge that West Germany is a member of the free world and a very important ally in that part of Europe. And he's trying to help recover a country plagued by the guilt of the Nazis and to allow historical forgiveness and allow the German people to progress. And the trip was organized by Chancellor um, Helmut Kohl, who had made a lot of concessions to the Americans and standing up to the communist regime. Uh, on this trip, Chancellor Kohl had included a visit to a cemetery where several SS officers were buried. And Elie Wiesel, who by this point had a strong voice, verbally objected to this and raised his voice. And Reagan, for political reasons, ultimately chose to not concede to Wiesel's objections, but allowed him to come to the White House, where Reagan would present him with a Medal of Achievement, plus the opportunity to voice publicly his objections and his concerns and his thoughts in front of the world. And uh, these are the words we're going to read today. So, Christy, let's read this moving piece of writing. Sure. Uh, before we get started, though, I do want to point out, notice as you read it, how many times Vizel is going to use the words, Mr. President. This is an interesting choice because it demonstrates two things. First of all, it demonstrates this is a personal address, although it's being made publicly to the world between two men. Uh, but it also connotes respect because he's actually admonishing one of the most powerful men of the world for a decision that he's making, but he's not tearing him down. It is very respectful, but the speech, I'll say, speaks for itself. So you want to start it and then I'll pick yes. it up? Mr. President, I am grateful to you for the medal, but this medal is not mine alone. It belongs to all those who remember what SS killers have done to their victims. It was given to me by the American people for my writings, teaching, and for my testimony. When I write, I feel my invisible teacher standing over my shoulders, reading my words and judging their veracity. And while I feel responsible for the living, I feel equally responsible to the dead. Their memory dwells in my memory. Forty years ago, a young man awoke and he found himself an orphan in an orphaned world. What have I learned in the last 40 years? Small things. I learned the perils of language and those of silence. 
I learned that in extreme situations when human lives and dignity are at stake, neutrality is a sin. It helps the killers, not the victims. I learned the meaning of solitude, Mr. President. We were alone, desperately alone. Today is April 19th. And on April 19th, 1943, the Warsaw Ghetto rose in arms against the onslaught of the Nazis. They were so few and so young and so helpless, and nobody came to their help. And they had to fight what was then the mightiest legion in Europe. Every underground received help except the Jewish underground. And yet they managed to fight and resist and push back those Nazis and their accomplices for six weeks. And yet the leaders of the free world, Mr. President, knew everything and did so little or nothing, or at least nothing specifically to save Jewish children from death. You spoke of Jewish children, Mr. President. One million Jewish children perish. If I spent my entire life reciting their names, I would die before finishing the task. Mr. President, I have seen children. I have seen them being thrown in the flames alive. Words. They die on my lips. So I have learned, I have learned, I have learned the fragility of the human condition. And I'm reminded of a great moral essayist, the gentle and forceful Abe Rosenthal, having visited Auschwitz, once wrote an extraordinary reportage about the persecution of Jews. And he called it, forgive them not, Father, for they knew what they did. I have learned that the Holocaust was a unique and uniquely Jewish event, albeit with universal implications. Not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were victims. I've learned the danger of indifference, the crime of indifference. For the opposite of love I have learned is not hate, but indifference. Jews were killed by the enemy, but betrayed by their so-called allies who found political reasons to justify their indifference or passivity. Christy, can you take over and read some? Sure. But I have also learned that suffering confers no privileges. It all depends what one does with it. And this is why survivors, of whom you spoke, Mr. President, have tried to teach their contemporaries how to build on ruins, how to invent hope in a world that offers none, how to proclaim faith to a generation that has seen it shamed and mutilated, And I believe, we believe, that memory is the answer, perhaps the only answer. A few days ago, on the anniversary of the liberation of Buchenwald, all of us, Americans, watched with dismay and anger as the Soviet Union and East Germany distorted both past and present history. Mr. President, I was there. I was there when American liberators arrived and they gave us back our lives. And what I felt for them then nourishes me to the end of my days and will do so. If you only knew what we tried to do with them then, we who were so weak that we couldn't carry our own lives, we tried to carry them in triumph. Mr. President, we are grateful to the American Army for liberating us. We are grateful to this country, the greatest democracy in the world, the freest nation in the world, the moral nation, the authority in the world. And we are grateful, especially to this country, for having offered us haven and refuge and grateful to its leadership for being so friendly to Israel. And Mr. President... Do you know that the ambassador of Israel who sits next to you, who is my friend and has been so for many years, is himself a survivor? And if you knew all the causes we fought together for the last 30 years, you should be prouder of him, and we are proud of him. And we are grateful, of course, to Israel. We are eternally grateful to Israel for existing. We needed Israel in 1948 if we need it now, and we are grateful to Congress for its continuous philosophy of humanism and compassion for the underprivileged. And as for yourself, Mr. President, we are so grateful to you for being a friend of the Jewish people, for trying to help the oppressed Jews in the Soviet Union, and to do whatever we can to save Sharonaski and Abe Stoller and I.F. Begin and Sakharov and all the dissidents who need freedom. And of course, we thank you for your support of the Jewish state, Mr. President, Ms. the Jewish state of Israel. But Mr. President, I wouldn't be the person I am, and you wouldn't respect me for what I am, 
if I were not to tell you also of the sadness that is in my heart for what happened during the last week. And I'm sure that you too are sad for the same reasons. What can I do? I belong to a traumatized generation. And to us, as to you, symbols are important. And furthermore, following our ancient tradition, and we are speaking about Jewish heritage, our tradition commands us to speak truth to power. So may I speak to you, Mr. President, with respect and admiration of the events that happened. We have met four or five times, and each time I came away enriched, for I know of your commitment to humanity. And therefore, I'm convinced, as you have told us earlier when we spoke, that you were not aware of the presence of S.S. Graves in the Bitburg Cemetery. Of course, you didn't know, but now we are all aware. May I, Mr. President, if it's possible at all, implore you to do something else, to find a way, to find another way, another site. That place, Mr. President, is not your place. Your place is with the victims of the SS. Oh, we know there are political and strategic reasons, but this issue, as all issues related to that awesome event, transcends politics and diplomacy. The issue here is not politics, but good and evil, and we must never confuse them. For I've seen the SS at work, and I've seen their victims. They were my friends. They were my parents. Mr. President, there was a degree of suffering and loneliness in the concentration camps that defies imagination. Cut off from the world with no refuge anywhere. Sons watched helplessly their fathers being beaten to death. Mothers watched their children die of hunger. And then there was Mengele and his selections. Terror, fear, isolation, torture, gas chambers, flames, flames rising to the heavens. But Mr. President, I know and understand, we all do, that you seek reconciliation. And so do I. So do we, and I wish to attain true reconciliation with the German people. I do not believe in collective guilt, nor in collective responsibility. Only the killers were guilty. Their sons and their daughters are not. And I believe, Mr. President, that we can and we must work together with them and with all people. And we must work to bring peace and understanding to a tormented world that, as you know, is still awaiting redemption. I thank you, Mr. President. Well, Christy, it feels uh, inappropriate to to pick that speech apart the way we normally do when we analyze literature. And uh, there's a solemnity of tone and an emotion that speaks uh, as he talks about redemption as someone who lost everything and then rebuilt. Well, you're absolutely right. And I don't feel the need to dissect it, although we will be dissecting the book But today, uh, to end our discussion, I think it's most fitting to end with a beautiful account from the personal life of Ellie Wiesel. Wiesel took a long time to get married, as you can imagine. But finally, at age 40, he married a beautiful Austrian woman, another Holocaust survivor that has her own story, Marion. Her maiden name was Erster. They had one son together. And although she did have a daughter from a previous marriage, for Ellie, this would be his only child. These are Ellie Wiesel's words on the birth of his son. Want to read them? Yes. My son's first name is Shlomo. It was my father's name. His middle name, Elisha, means God of salvation. We Jews believe in names so much. I was the only son. I cannot break the chain. It's impossible that 3,500 years should end with me. So I took those 3,500 years and put them on the shoulders of this little child. Later he said this, And so I will tell my son that survival in itself is a virtue. It has become the virtue of mankind, and that virtue we Jews have taught mankind. It is important. I will tell my son that all the fires... All the pain will be meaningless if he in turn will not transmit our story together to his friends and one day to his children. As a son of a survivor, Shlomo Elisha Vizel thus carries on his back an awesome baggage of history. Well, it's hard to imagine how it must have been for both father and son. 
as Elisha stood at his father's side in Oslo, Norway, when the Norwegian monarch presented Elie Wiesel with the Nobel Peace Prize. After graduation from Yale, nonetheless, Elisha has had a very successful career, in case you're wondering, as an engineer and uh, a leader at Goldman Sachs. He's continued the tradition of his family by raising large amounts of money for various charities, and he's, of course, very involved in various freedom causes around the world. But it would be a hard legacy to live up to. An impossible legacy to live up to. God bless him. Yes. That ends our first episode in this fantastic series on Ellie Bazell and the book Night. And next week we will tackle that book starting on page one, sentence one, which we've already actually read. And then we'll talk through chapters one, two, and three and the Bazell's family's life for the Holocaust, the train ride to Auschwitz, and their arrival at Birkenau. And we hope you will support How to Love Lit podcast by telling your friends sharing your favorite episode via email or text and uh, by following us on Instagram and Facebook. And if you're a teacher, checking out or teaching materials on our website, howtolovelitpodcast.com. Peace out.